Good morning, First Baptist Church family, and welcome to this Tuesday morning as we continue to look at the book of Amos. I do apologize for being late. Initially, I had planned on uh, starting at 1030, as I always do, but a few things popped up and I wasn't able to do so. So we're a little late, but you know what? It's my birthday and I can do what I want to. So we're late. We'll just have to deal with it. Amos chapter 8, I will be reading from the message version. I say this every week. I, I strongly encourage you, if you use the Bible app on your phone or iPad, to download Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible, which is the message. It is such a good translation. It's very readable. It's easy to understand, uh, and, and it's read like a story. So, um, I would encourage you to, to download that translation. I encourage your feedback. Please say hello. Please say good morning. See that my hair is sticking up. Please uh, uh, offer your prayer requests. Those will be added to our church-wide uh, prayer list. Uh, but, but just know how much I appreciate uh, being able to interact with you. Amos chapter 8. I always begin each discussion with background information because it's so important to know the context. And for most of our Old Testament books, unfortunately, we, we don't know the context well. We, we know the New Testament well. We, we turn to the New Testament whenever we, we need some comfort, especially the Gospels, or at least if you're like me, you turn to the Gospels and see what Jesus has to say. But very often do we, do we turn to these minor prophets like we're uh, going through. Hello to you, Trace Jones. So we, we don't often turn to books like Amos. So it's so important that instead of jumping in and, and studying the text, that we know what was happening uh, in the background behind this writing. Amos uh, was an 8th century prophet he lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. He was a farmer. He worked the land. We read this last week. And yet he was called to God's service. And he's called to go to the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, the, the northern and the southern kingdom were split around 1,080 something. I'm thinking if I could remember my seminary classes. Anyway, it was around 1,000 they split. This is the 8th century, 700s. Um, and so he leaves the south, and he goes up to the north to speak this harsh word of judgment against the Israelites, the people of God. This has been a letter of harsh judgment. It's been a word of mostly bad news. God gives them a few chances. We've read this. He extends some grace. And yet the people of God do not hear this clarion call from Amos to change their ways and to take care of those who are in need. Here we are at chapter 8. We're almost at the very end. Chapter 9 is the end of this short book, so next week we'll be done. But if you would join me as we read chapter 8 of Amos. My master God showed me this vision. A bowl of fresh fruit. He said, what do you see, Amos? And Amos said, a bowl of fresh ripe fruit. And God says, right. I'm calling it quits with my people Israel. I'm no longer acting as if everything is just fine. The royal singers will wail when it happens. My master God said so. Corpses will be strewn here and there and everywhere. Hush, listen to this. You who walk over the weak, you who treat the poor people as less than nothing, who say, when's my next paycheck coming so I can go out and live it up? How long till the weekend when I can go out and have a good time? Who give little and take much? Never do an honest day's work. You exploit the poor, poor, using them, and then when they're used up, you discard them. God swears against the arrogance of Jacob. I'm keeping track of their every sin. God's oath will shake earth's foundations. Dissolve the whole world into tears. God's oath will sweep in like a water that rises, flooding houses and lands, and then receives leaving behind a sea of mud. 
on judgment day, watch out. These are the words of God, my master. I'll turn off the sun at noon and then the middle of the day, the earth will go black. I'll turn your parties into funerals and make every song you sing a dirge. Everyone will walk around in rags with sunken eyes and bald heads. Think of the worst thing that could happen. Your only son say murder. That's a hint of judgment day that's to come. Thank you, Janie Berry, for wishing me good morning and a happy birthday. I appreciate that. Oh, yes, judgment day is coming. These are the words of my master God. I'll send a famine through the whole country. It won't be food or water that's lacking, but my word People will drift from one in the country to another, roam to the north, wander to the east. They'll go anywhere, listen to anyone hoping to hear God's word, but they won't hear it. On judgment day, lovely young girls will faint of word thirst. Robust young men will think of God's thirst. Along with those who take oaths at the Sumerian sin and sex center, saying, as the Lord God of Dan is my witness, the, the lady goddess of Beersheba bless you. Their lives will fall to pieces. They'll never be put it, they'll never put it together again. More bad news, is it not? Especially on my birthday of all days. Thank you, Amos, for dragging down this joyful day for me. Nevertheless, it's bad news. It's a word of judgment against the people of God living in the north. Notice the imagery at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, Amos likens the people of God to a bowl of fresh fruit. And at first, at first you think, well, this isn't so bad. They're fresh fruit. They're ripe. Think about uh, the fresh fruit sitting on your counter. So in the Strasser household, we have a banana holder. You know what I'm talking about. And when we first buy the fruit, it's typically not close to being ripe. And so it, the bananas are still green. And I'll walk beside that banana holder every morning to get my coffee. And I'll think, I cannot wait until these bananas are ripe so I can enjoy them. A few days will go by. And before you know it, the green disappears. They become more yellow. There's some brown spots. And so I'll grab a banana, and I'll enjoy that ripe banana. But, but here's what I often find. Um, they often go bad quickly. When they're ripe, they don't stay ripe for long. They, they spoil. And so you may have a day or two window there in which they're ripe, and they're fresh, and they're good to eat. But you know, if you leave them too long, they spoil. And so when they're ripe, they're great. But the problem is they don't stay ripe forever. I, I think that's what Amos is trying to convey to the people up north. You're, you're a basket of fresh, ripe fruit now. But you're not going to stay fresh for too much longer. Meaning there will be judgment. You will soon spoil. You think that all is well now, you're living lavishly, you're having these ornate worship services that are hollow, but um, you're not going to stay right forever. You will spoil. The day is coming in which you will spoil. And again, it's more and more bad news. Corpses will be strewn here or there. And he reminds them of the reason why that they will spoil. He said this throughout this book. You walk over the weak. You treat the poor people uh, as like they're nothing. All you're concerned about is your paycheck, making money, living it up, going out and having a good time, exploiting the poor. They're used up. You discard them. So this is a word of justice, or rather injustice. That's the theme that we find running throughout this entire book is a theme of injustice. The people of God, they can say the right things, they go to worship at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, but it's for naught. It's so hollow. They live a certain way on Sunday morning, but as soon as they leave the church house, 
they act as if everything they had just said and prayed has completely gone over their heads, one through one ear and out the other. Folks, I, I don't want to be like this. I, I don't want to be the kind of church where we come in on Sunday morning and, and we lift our voices up to God and we pray that God will be at work in our lives and that we will be the hands and feet uh, in the world, and then we walk out the door and we act as if we've never heard any of that. We didn't sing those hymns, we didn't pray, we didn't hear to the scriptures read, we didn't allow the, the scriptures to, to take root in our hearts. I don't want to be known for that, but nevertheless, that's how the people of God in the northern kingdom are known. They say the right things, but they don't do the right things. They're arrogant. Um, Amos says, judgment day is coming. Uh, everything is going to go black. All of their parties will become funerals. Your only son will be murdered. This is awful, awful. Again, 11, judgment day is coming. And probably the worst part of this chapter is found in verses 11 through 12. It won't be food or water that's lacking. It's my word. So God is going to stop speaking. That's the worst thing that could happen. The, the, their world will be godless. God is going to make his exit. Could you, imagine, could you imagine if God stopped speaking to us today? How does God speak to us? God speaks to us in prayer. God speaks to us through the gift of the Spirit of God. God speaks to us through Scripture. God speaks to us uh, through fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, could you imagine if, if God stopped speaking, if we didn't have the gift of Scripture, the gift of the Spirit of God, or, or God stopped speaking in prayer, or God stopped speaking through our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Could you imagine... A season in which God has just stopped speaking and has forgotten how to speak. I know there have been days when we have thought that maybe God is silent, but, but, but I can assure you God has not stopped speaking. And yet he tells the people up north, there's going to be a day when um, food and water won't be lacking but my word. And we know that the word of God gives us sustenance to be able to grapple with difficult seasons. I don't know about you, but I would never want to, to be in a season in which God completely stops speaking. And yet God says, judgment day is coming, I will stop speaking. You will take your oaths at Samaria and Dan and the lady God, goddess of Beersheba. And so they're, they have idols there. They go, since God has stopped speaking, they go to their idols. And yet throughout this book, they've gone to their idols even when God has been speaking. It, it really is a harsh word. And so even on this wonderful day, August 11th, in which uh, it is your pastor's birthday, I was hoping for some good news from Amos, but there's, there's really not much good news here. If there is good news, and I'm grasping at straws, um, I think take delight in the fact that God has not stopped speaking to us. God says uh, to the people in the north, and on judgment day, I'm going to stop speaking. Uh, but when I read scripture, especially when I read the words of Jesus, I, I don't ever hear Jesus say, I'm going to stop speaking to you. That just shows the kind of grace and willingness to forgive and patience that God has. Uh, that, that God never utters these words to people like us. I hope that God will never utter these words because I need the sustenance of the word of God. Chapter 9 is our final chapter. We will dive into chapter 9 next Tuesday. So thank you so much for joining us for this time of spiritual reflection. Have a great day.